Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight. In a moment, we will go to our study. You will see that we will not have a bulletin, but we'll go directly to our teaching, and then we'll conclude the teaching with a few words of encouragement to you who are viewing our services online. Please take the opportunity of letting us know that you're watching, and if you desire to give an offering, you can do so online. If you're watching us via computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, follow the instruction under Four Ways to Give to process your gift. You can also mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710. And remember, you can still come in and use the kiosks we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts, or you can place your gift in an envelope and hand it to one of our receptionists in the foyer. Thank you. And with that, let's get into the teaching. Let's open our Bibles to the Song of Solomon. I'll give you a few minutes to find that book. Song of Solomon. Because we're going to start a series in Song of Solomon, and we'll begin today by looking at chapter chapter 1, and we'll be covering verses 1 through 8. So as you're uh, looking for Song of Solomon, a couple of uh, announcements. Tonight, we begin a new series in our evening service. We meet here for our evening service at 5 o'clock tonight, and I'm going to be doing a series on spiritual warfare. So I invite you to be with us because all of you who are believers in Jesus Christ are presently involved in spiritual warfare. And uh, Paul gives to us great insight into the weapons that God has given to us in order that we might do all and that we ultimately would stand victorious. And so we'll begin tonight by looking at Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13, And we're going to actually begin by looking at the origin and fall of Satan. And then we're going to pick up in Ephesians 6 next week and following, looking at each item of uh, weapons that God has given to us individually. I invite you to be with us tonight as we gather for our evening service at 5 o'clock and as we begin our series on spiritual warfare. Then on Wednesday, I'd also encourage you, if you're able to be with us, to be with us on Wednesday as we continue our study in the Gospel of John. We're in chapter 7 this upcoming Wednesday, and I'd encourage you to read that chapter and come prepared for the study. That's John chapter 7 on Wednesday night. And then finally, this upcoming Friday at 4.30, I've been asked to invite you to my daughter Anna's wedding. My daughter's getting married this upcoming Friday here in the church. And the, the ceremonies at 4.30. If you could be with us, we'd love to have you as our guests. Um, she was real awkward about extending an invitation because not everybody's going to be able to go to the uh, reception afterwards. And she was awkward about that, and uh, as she should be because I'm paying for the reception. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> you know, so you're not invited. No, but if you'd like to, but I'd love to have you join in the celebration of my daughter uh, and Gabe, her fiancé, soon-to-be husband, um, (laughs) this upcoming uh, Friday. I'd love to have you with us. Um, You know, first service, I was real emotional sharing that. Second service, you get a little harder. Third service, ah, it's a party. You know, I mean, (laughs) I don't know what to say, you know. It's kind of like sin. It hardens you. But, um, Today we're going to be looking at Song of Solomon. It's actually Song of Songs, and you'll see in just a moment why that's referred to in that way. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to take us through a series in this particular book. I've never taught this book to the entire congregation. I have two years ago I taught this uh, this book to our uh, our Monday night study that we have. It was for the 18 to 35 year olds, and and I've been thinking about. Um, teaching it to the entire church. And so this is the first time in all the years I've been teaching that I've ever taught this book to the entire congregation. And and it's an interesting, interesting book. It speaks concerning romance and love. And that's what we'll be looking at as we go through this particular uh, book that is called The Song of Songs or The Song of Solomon. So let's begin reading together 
in uh, chapter 1. We'll begin reading at verse 1. I'll read to verse 8, and we'll get into our study. The Song of Songs, which is Solomon's. Let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. Because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. Lead me away. We will run after you. The king has brought me into his chambers. We will be glad and rejoice in you. We will remember your love more than wine. Rightly do they love you. I'm dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Do not look upon me because I am dark, because the sun has tanned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me the keeper of the vineyards, but my own vineyard I have not kept. Tell me, O you whom I love, where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself by the flocks of your companions? If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tents. What does that mean? <laughs> I haven't got a clue. No, um, I'll share with you some things as we go through this. But let's begin by simply saying this. This book is normally referred to as the Song of Solomon. Actually, it is literally the Song of Songs because in Hebrew, those are the first two words of chapter 1, verse 1, Song of Songs. But it's called the Song of Songs because even as it says in verse 1, the Song of Songs, which is Solomon, therefore it's really the Song of Songs, but also called the Song of Solomon. And calling it the Song of Solomon actually gives more uh, sense to the entire book. You see, when you read your Bible and you look at 1 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 32, in that scripture it states that Solomon spoke 3,000 proverbs and he wrote 1,005 songs. And Solomon is described in the Bible as having wisdom and understanding, and he's spoken of as having a, a heart that is so large it's really beyond understanding. You see that in 1 Kings 4.29. So you could see that this was a man who was prolific in his writing, 3,000 Proverbs, 1,005 songs, but this is what they call his greatest hit. This was his song of songs. This is a song above all songs. Now, when you look at the life of, of Solomon, you'll notice that, that he actually wrote three books that you find in the Bible. Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs. He wrote Ecclesiastes, as well as Song of Songs. The Song of Songs was written somewhere around 965 years before Christ. So it's said that he wrote Proverbs in his middle age. He wrote Ecclesiastes when he was an old man, but he wrote Song of Songs when he was a young man. And this is a book that can be looked at as the premier book relating to what is called romantic love. This is a book that is a love story, a love story that has two main characters. You have Solomon. Solomon was a king of Israel, and his kingship is mentioned five times. It's mentioned in chapter 1, verse 4, chapter 1, verse 12, chapter 3, verse 9, chapter 3, verse 11, as well as chapter 7, verse 5. So you have one character, the king by the name of Solomon. But you also have another character, a woman who is simply referred to as the Shulamite. The reason she's called a Shulamite is because she's in a region in the lowest place portion of Galilee, and therefore she was from that region, and she was a Shulamite. Some believe that her family was employed by Solomon. You see a hint of that in chapter 8, verse 11, but that's conjecture. What this is, though, is a love song. It's a love song that exalts the purity of marital love, and it's a love song that exalts true romance. And when it's viewed from the position of being a love song, you get great practical understanding. Now, somebody would say, why should we spend some time looking at this kind of book? Aren't people able to instinctively just determine who it is that they're going to marry? And a lot of people think that. They think, well, yeah, you know, I don't need any instruction. I don't need any encouragement. I know how to choose the right person to marry and all of that. There are those who believe in something called love at first sight. 
I would wonder how many, though I won't ask you to raise your hand, I would wonder how many in this room actually believe in such a concept, love at first sight. You know, I was seated there in the restaurant, and the door opened up, and there she was, you know, floating across slowly with crystal slippers. Some people believe in love at first sight. Some are openly, oh, yes, man, the minute I saw her, I was in love with her. Well, it's interesting. There was a, nas- a national survey uh, that was actually taken that surveyed uh, men, and uh, some 48% of the men said that they believe in love at first sight. Interesting to me. 48% of men surveyed in this national survey say that they believe in love at first sight. But when they were questioned deeper, Concerning what they mean by love at first sight, something interesting was found out. Uh, What in reality was happening was this. Within the first few minutes of meeting a woman, they are actually wondering if they would like to sleep with that woman. And so that's what they were referring to as love at first sight. In reality, what the men were actually speaking about was physical attraction. And it's a fact that men are obviously attracted visually. And so it's easy for a man to think, man, she's a doll, I'm in love with her, when in reality, that's not what's going on at all. And so the fact is, our culture is so absolutely caught up with the idea of romance that it pervades everything, and we could be filled with that without even realizing it. We can have the sense of romance that the culture gives, and we're not even aware that we have that. My wife, Marie... And I, on occasion, she doesn't really watch TV, but on occasion, this occurs. I don't know if you know this or not. I've never really mentioned it to you. I probably should say this. You know, I'm a surfer. People don't know I'm a surfer. I'm a, I'm a channel surfer. <laughs> you know, I have a lot of channel surfers. Can I get an amen? I'm a channel surfer. You know, and I'll sit there with the remote, you know, and I'll just surf. And Marie doesn't really watch TV very much, but she'll be seated next to me, and she'll have the newspaper in front of her, and she's reading that or a magazine while I'm surfing. And then all of a sudden, I'll hit this Lifetime movie. And you hear this woman saying, oh, I don't know, he's so mean to me. Oh yeah, you ought to kill him. You'll do it at the end of the movie because that's all you ever see on Lifetime, some angry woman killing all the men. (laughs) It's true. It's true. They're always... Anyway, so, man, the minute Marie hears that woman's voice, there goes the newspaper. It comes down, and she's looking, and, man, I'm just pushing the button. I'm getting out of here. I'm going to watch this. Let's see some UFC fighting or something. I'm going to see it. I'm going to watch this. But that's the way it is. Love, you know, the idea of love, the, the notion of romantic love, it, it grabs people. And that's why you have these, these uh, romance novels. You know, that's why you, you have these songs, so many songs that are simply what you used to call love songs. So though I do feel uh, a, a sense of sorrow for a younger generation because much of the songs that, that are popular today couldn't in any way, shape, or form be really be called a love song. You know, in many ways, they're just angry songs and all. But a lot of the songs will speak about love. A lot of the books that are sold love. You watch TV and women get, and men too, unfortunately, human beings get addicted to soap operas. And you go to the movies and and they always have this this idea of romance. And, And the funny thing about it, or sad as you define it really, is that casual sex that leads to love is the overall theme of what is called romance today. It's a casual sexual encounter, and then later on they discover they can care for each other, and you see that all the time. And so what happens is there's a definition for romance that is created that actually produces unrealistic expectations, and and we end up in relationships that are driven by hormones or, or wishful thinking, and they don't work out, and we get hurt. 
And some people never learn from their past mistakes, so they get into what are called serial relationships, one relationship after another, and they never even heal after the failed one they just got out of. And they move right into the next one with this idea that they're going to find the one. The one. Sometimes they think that the one is going to be at a club. The one is going to be at a bar. The one is going to be where they work out. They look for the one, and they want this individual in their life. And so they, they have a desire for romance. Well, we need to ask ourselves a question, even as we begin this study. And the question is this, what is attractive to you? What is it about a person of the opposite sex that you find to be most appealing? Obviously, physical attraction is fine. And it's normally the first thing that usually begins a relationship. But there has to be a sense of this person uh, being somebody you could spend more time with. Just because somebody may be good looking or beautiful doesn't mean that we can actually have a relationship. But we do admit and understand that uh, physical attraction is something that is generally one of the very first, if not the very first thing that begins a romantic relationship. Notice in verse 2 how this, this woman referred to as the Shulamite, notice what she says. She's speaking of Solomon. She says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth, for your love is better than wine. And so this is a physical attraction. This is something that causes her to have an attraction. There's something about this person, Solomon, that attracts her. And that's why she says, let him kiss me with the kisses of his mouth. I'm attracted to this man. Now, Solomon obviously was an extremely handsome man. Solomon was a very handsome man. When you read the Bible, and the Bible speaks of his father, David, the Bible says that David was an extremely handsome man, as is true for all Davids. No, and he was a... It says it somewhere in there. I'm sure it does. He was an extremely handsome man. And nobody would argue that Bathsheba was not beautiful. Because when David was there looking down at her bathing, he was captivated by her beauty. She was an extraordinarily beautiful woman. David was absolutely a handsome man. They had a son named Solomon together. There's no doubt that Solomon was quite a hunk. This was a very handsome, handsome man. And so the Shulamite sees him and has an attraction. I want him to kiss me, is what she's saying. He is so, so handsome and so attractive. She says, his kisses will intoxicate me. So she wants him to kiss her. She actually longs for him to do so. Now, obviously there's nothing wrong with kissing but there are a whole lot of people who seem to make it into some kind of sport. You know, kissing on the first date isn't even thought about anymore. It's just a natural thing to do. You kiss them goodbye, you know, kiss them goodnight, kiss her goodnight. You don't even think about it. I'm one of these people who really caution against starting relationships, dating relationships on a physical level. I caution singles to be careful because when you begin to kiss, you're also going to begin to desire other things. That's just a bottom line fact. Women and men are still different in one thing, well, a lot of things, but one thing, and that is a woman very often can be kissed simply because she enjoys being kissed. Very often, a man kisses because it's first step to something else. It isn't because he just feels like kissing her lips. It's because that's a step in intimacy that he's hoping is going to move beyond that to other things. That's how men think. That's how men have always thought. Now, of course, you younger ladies are being taught today that you're really a man. You just built differently. You're taught that. I mean, there's a commercial. I happen to, I watch commercials not because I like them. I actually watch commercials because I analyze them. 
And, and I was watching one recently. All of us have seen this commercial. I forget. I don't even know what it's for. Frankly, I was so bothered by it. Where there's a, a football game going on. Some guy's going to run up the middle. And uh, there are two guys standing on the sidelines. And they're wearing their jeans and their T-shirts. And they have a, a drink in their hands, uh, probably a, a beer. And here comes this girl. And she stands like a guy. And she's leaning. She's got her beer. And she's dressed like a guy, her T-shirt and her jeans on. Hey, what's going on here? And I look at that, and it turns me off like nothing, like very few things do. I think this girl thinks she's a guy. Somebody taught her she's a guy. And these guys are talking to her like she's a guy. Now, maybe that's the way things are today, and I'm so old, I just don't know that. But there's just something about that that just turns me off. Women who are being taught that they're like men, and they are men. They're not men at all. And the fact of the matter is that women can still allow a guy to kiss her and, and she doesn't necessarily get anything out of it, but the guy does. And within a short time, he's bored with kissing, I guarantee you. And so be very careful in your dating relationship, those of you who are single, those of you unmarried, that you don't just enter into physicality simply because you think it's normal and part of dating. It is not necessarily that way. And just because somebody bought you a meal or took you to a movie doesn't mean you owe them something after the date. You don't. And so in the case of the Shulamite, she sees him. She's very attracted to him. She'd even like him to kiss her, but there are other things going on that you're going to see in just a moment. Notice how she says in verse 3, because of the fragrance of your good ointments, your name is ointment poured forth. Therefore, the virgins love you. And so as she's looking at him, she's saying, you know, not only are you attractive, you even smell good. You have an ointment. It's a, a fragrance. And uh, you, you smell good. This indicates that he's clean and he takes care of his appearance. And that's a pretty good hint. If you're unmarried, guys, take a bath. <laughs> you, you'll probably have a date or two after the first one. <laughs> brushing your teeth is a good habit and wearing deodorant that helps I had a guy in the army who uh, bunked above me who didn't wear deodorant he did not wear deodorant it's kind of like Lazarus you know he stinks and I remember telling him I, I finally said listen you know Deodorant is your friend. <laughs> Put some on. And his answer to me was, no, I'll get in the habit. He says, once you put on deodorant, you have to do it as a habit. That's just a good habit. That's not a bad habit. Get into the habit, man. Get addicted, but do it. <laughs> you will not have any dates, I promise you. He started dating a girl, and before you know it, he wore cologne and he wore deodorant. He, he, he got the message. Well, she's saying his fragrance is beautiful, and she's speaking of the fact that this is a man who's obviously very attractive and cares for himself. But I want you to notice something. It goes deeper than that in verse 3. She says to him, your name is ointment poured forth. Now, that's something that she finds attractive beyond his physicality because this is a man who is handsome in physical appearance, but it is overshadowed by his reputation. Your name is ointment. What seems to be attractive to her is his character. You see, in Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 1, it says, a good name is better than precious ointment. What she's saying is not just that he bathes and brushes his teeth, that she, he puts on ointment. During that day, the men would uh, not bathe as often as we do today. And because of the, um, just the, the climate, they would actually put a fragrant ointment on them to keep their skin from drying out. And it also hid uh, the odors, the natural odors and all that he didn't find to be attractive. She appreciates that, but she goes deeper than that. And that's really what I want to point out. Because not only did she find him attractive, but there was something deeper than his simple, the way he looks and how handsome he is to her. And that is that this man has character. 
This is a man of character. This is a man with a reputation. And notice how she says, uh, therefore, the virgins love you. Now, that's given us some insight because his character is revealed because he could be trusted with a woman's purity. His character is of such nature that he can be trusted with a woman's purity. In some dating relationships, when the man finds that the girl he's with is pure, then to take her purity becomes a prize for him. He actually goes after her. He sees her virtue as a prize to be won. What she's saying is Solomon is a gentleman. He treats women the way they ought to be, to be treated as ladies. And that is a very attractive thing. I have a granddaughter named Sophie who's soon to turn four. She's three years old at the moment. Just this week, we were walking together, and we came to a door. And she stopped. And you got a picture. She's just a little thing, three years old. She stops at the door. And she looks up at me, and she says to me, Men open doors for ladies. I love it. I loved it. I said, absolutely. Don't you forget that. When you get older, baby, I actually did. I said, when you get older, you remember what you just said, baby girl, because that is right. Gentlemen open doors for ladies. That's right, baby. You see, today there are some ladies who actually take insult in that. I open the door for women all the time, of course. But, you know, some of you ladies have perhaps seen this. You know, a man opens the door and a woman just barges through. They don't even turn and say thank you. They just expect it. They just walk through. You know, I'm used to that. I don't even expect anything to be said now because 99% of the women who walk through the door don't even notice you opened it. But I remember hearing of one man who opened the door for a woman. The woman stops at the door and looks at the man and says, you don't have to open the door because I'm a lady. And he looked back at her and he said, I didn't open the door because you're a lady. I opened the door because I'm a gentleman. And there's this mentality that we need to have and you really ought to have that mentality and so this woman sees this man as somebody who actually knows how to treat a lady, how to treat her. And she has character so much so that he's not hitting on her girlfriends. The virgins trust you. You're a man that actually can be trusted. And, and she loves not only the fact that he's extremely handsome, he cares for himself, but he's got a reputation and the reputation is very good. So if you want a relationship that is strong, it's not just the physical attraction. It's not just the outward appearance. Look for somebody who has character. The Bible in Proverbs 31.30 says, Charm is deceitful. Beauty is passing. But a woman who fears the Lord, she shall be praised. Outer beauty is not all there is to it. Look for character. Now, I wonder how many of you in this room have ever heard of Jimmy Soul. Anybody? Raise your hand. I'd love to see. Jimmy Soul. Anybody? Nobody. Poor Jimmy, he's upset. <laughs> You've never heard of Jimmy Soul. Do you recognize these words? If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, never make a pretty woman your wife. So from my personal point of view, get an ugly girl to marry you. <laughs> Don't let your friends say you have no taste. Go ahead and marry anyway. Though her face is ugly, her eyes don't match, Take it from me, she's a better catch. <laughs> he got that right out of the Bible. <laughs> Character. Character matters. Character always matters. Beauty fades. A man's handsome, it, it, it maybe not, but he, it fades. I had an uncle whom I loved very much, and I, I only knew him as an older man. I knew him when he was in his late 60s, and I was just a little boy. And, uh, you know, he had little pot belly, and, and uh, you know, he had balded and all. I loved him very, very much. Not a very attractive man, but one day he and I were talking, and he actually pulled a picture out of him, uh, of him, this picture of him, pulled it out to show me it was when he was a young man in World War I, and he was a, uh, he was a Marine and he was in his uniform, and my Uncle Louis was a very handsome man when he was a young man. 
but I didn't know him as a handsome man, as an older man, because age does what age does. And so if you're looking right now for just the outside, just remember gravity happens to everybody. And that 44 inch chest becomes a 46 inch waist, I tell you. <laughs> that just does what it does. So there's got to be something greater than that, I promise you. So there's the physical and there's the spiritual, the character. And the character element uh, is, is because in New Testament terms, it's because, because our character is formed through our relationship with Jesus Christ, our love for his word, and the work of his Holy Spirit. And, and we ought to be looking in relationships to those who love the Lord. And not, you're not going to find the one when you go to a, to a club. You're not going to find the one when you go to a bar. You're not going to find them there. You're going to normally find them where the Lord is worshipped. And so we need to have a relationship with God. And, and, and Solomon really was somebody of character that she could trust in. And that's why, again, she says, all the virgins love you. This is a person with such a great reputation that solid Christians would love to date them. Now, again, there's something else here. His reputation was good, she says, like ointment. The ointment she's talking about is actually made out of olive oil, and olive oil is the result of olives that are being pressed. And so when you put the olives in the pits in and they're pressed, the olive oil comes out, especially from the center, especially from the pit. That's where the um, beautiful olive oil comes out. And so what you're really dealing with is character. And when she speaks concerning his, his character being like oil and the oil, that ointment being made out of olive oil, then you realize that his character is revealed and the way his character is revealed is under pressure. You can be really cool and have a real cool character and, oh, you know, have the Christianese down, you know, praise the Lord, oh, yeah, let's pray. You can have that attitude in church, but when you begin to date somebody and you see them going through pressure within the first few dates, you may see them under pressure, you get an idea what they're really like. And if this person's got a bad temper, if this person's dominating, if this is a person that is a controller, if this is a person who is, is pushy, this person has a bad, you know, kind of a sullen, kind of a uh, upset attitude or is depressed all the time, ask yourself if that's really what you want to be hooked up with for the rest of your life. Because if you're dating, you don't, know, you don't need to put up with that. It's interesting in verse 4 how it says, lead me away. This is the one, when it says, lead me away, this is the one that you would love bringing home to meet the family. This is the one that you want to be seen with at church. This is the one that you're blessed to be asked out by. This is somebody that you're not kind of like saying, uh, I'll see you at church, and you kind of sit next to him, but not really. It's, you know, you put your Bible between you and your whatever, so you're not, so people don't know you're together. You know, this is a person that you're going to take them home to meet mom and dad. To go through that gauntlet, you bring them on home and dad looks at them and says to them, so who are you? What are you doing with my girl? Oh, I just want to take your girl out. Oh, really? Why? Well, because I like her. How do you know? You don't even know her. If you knew her, you wouldn't like her. <laughs> yeah, that's my baby. It's my girl. I don't mind going back to prison. <laughs> you know, you bring them home to meet daddy and mama. That's the kind of person, you know, you want to bring a good person. You want to bring somebody with character. You want to bring somebody who has not that charm, because I can tell you, you know, especially as an older guy now, but even, you know, you know, there's an old saying, it takes a con to know a con. Um, you know, and I lived a life of a liar for a long time, so I can pretty much smell out lies pretty easily. And I know when they're lying to me. And I've, I've, I've you know, I've met the guys, you know, who won't look you in the eye when you shake their hands. Got that little thing, you know. And, uh -uh, and you hold on to them, pull them closer. <laughs> Anybody there? <laughs> you know? You want the guy who
who's going to date your girl, or you want the girl who's with your son to be somebody who's got character. And when your, your daughter brings home that guy or your son brings home that girl and says, I want you to marry, I want to, you to meet this person I care about, you want to have a connection with them. You really do. My daughter, Anna, when she uh, told us that she was dating a young man named Gabe, Gabriel, we, uh, I said, well, great, let's, uh, you know, let's take him out for dinner. And so Marie and I took Gabe and Anna out, had a meal with him. And he, you know, he's a real quiet kind of guy. And he was sitting across the table from us, and he's directly in front of me, you know, Anna's to my left and Marie's to my right, and Gabe's in my sights. <laughs> and I said to him, um, are you nervous? He looks at me. He's a very confident man, a very confident young man. He goes, no, I'm not. I said, yes, you are. <laughs> I said, yes, you are. I said, I'll tell you why. Because when I met my wife's dad, I was nervous. I said, you're nervous. I said, that's okay. I understand. Because he needed to be nervous. Because I'm one of these dads who scrutinizes. I look very closely at that person. I don't... I don't make the decision for my daughter. My daughter needs to choose whom the Lord has given to her. That's her responsibility, but I'm the father. I, I want to have somebody who's going to be with my daughter who's going to treat her the way she ought to be treated. That's what dads normally do. That's how we are. And, and he passed the test with flying colors, quite, quite honestly. And so there's that sense that this is a person that can go through this and uh, the scrutiny and actually come out shining. And that's what it was like there. This one is the one that you'd bring home. Now, notice how it says in verse 4, the king has brought me into his chambers. Uh, this can tra be translated, may the king draw me into his chambers. In other words, in her heart, she desires to be close to him and to be loved by him, even to marry him. Well, going on in verse 5, I am dark but lovely, O daughters of Jerusalem, like the tents of Kedar, like the curtains of Solomon. Uh, the tents were made of black wool. The, the, the tents she's speaking of, the tents of Kedar, it was black wool. Solomon's curtains would be made of a deep purple. What she's saying is, and I want you to notice in verse 5, she's simply saying, I am dark but lovely. She is a woman who doesn't need constant attention. She doesn't need to be told how beautiful she was because she was aware of that. You know, not all men are capable of communicating these kinds of things. This is a woman who's self-aware. Some of you ladies have a husband or a boyfriend who may be very natural at this. He's able to look at you and say, you look, you look beautiful today. You know, and, and he may say it so easy that you begin to think, is that just something you say? You know, and there are other guys who, you know, you're with and, and they don't even notice. They don't, you know, you may spend an hour and a half putting on your eye makeup. And, and you come out, and it's, every eyelash is perfect. And he says to you, let's go. He doesn't even notice. There are guys like that. You know that, don't you? Some of you are married. To, that's the way we are. That's men. You know, and, 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 and there's nothing wrong with that. But that's the way a lot of us are. And this was a woman who was saying, I'm dark, and she's got dark from the sun. She actually was, by her brothers, told, you need to work out in the fields. And at that time, a woman would, would not necessarily work out in the fields because she didn't want to be tanned by the sun. But this was a woman who was under authority. She, she was under the right authority, the authority of her family. She did that, which was the proper thing to do in her culture and during her time. And she's simply saying, my dark skin came as a result of me actually following the authority that I've been placed under, which I have to tell you is very attractive to a man, especially the husband, to have a wife who is under proper God-given authority is such a blessing. So her character is revealed by her submission to authority. This is a hard-working woman under proper authority. Now, in verse 7, Tell me, O you whom I love, 
where you feed your flock, where you make it rest at noon. For why should I be as one who veils herself? Notice that phrase, as one who veils herself by the flock, flocks of your companions. Why should I be as one who veils herself? Now, when you read that, that, that may not make any sense to you at all until you know the culture once again. In Solomon's time, the women who veiled themselves at noon were prostitutes. Why should I be as one who veils herself? He said, where you make it rest at noon, why should I be? She's saying, I have character. That's what she's saying. She's saying, I'm not one who compromises. She was not a woman who was willing to compromise her walk just to be married. She didn't compromise. Someone says, how do I know when I'm ready to be married? Well, you're ready when you do not have to make compromises in your relationship to God. You're ready when you do not have to lower the bar just because you begin to think you're getting older and you're never going to be able to get married. You see, if you're being tempted or pressured to do something you know is wrong, don't compromise. Don't compromise yourself so that you might keep somebody because you're in hopes that that person is going to marry you. Especially when you begin to compromise your walk with the Lord and to do things that you ought not to do. There's an old saying that I think is still, is still used. Uh, you know, why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? And, and there are guys who, who, who actually live by that. Why would I get into a marital relationship and have a, you know, the physicality of it when I don't need to be married to have that? And so don't compromise. There are guys there are guys who actually will use scripture to try and convince women that it's okay to have physical relations with them. I have ministered in this church many years ago to a woman who went through that with somebody who was a wolf who came in and used scripture to convince her that it was okay for her to involve herself in a physical relationship with him. Don't compromise. If you're interested in a guy or in a woman, if you're a man and you're interested in a woman, don't, don't go out with them and spend time with them and get romantically involved with them if, if they make fun of your walk with God. Don't, don't compromise if they make fun of your friends and relationship you have with them and your walk with God with them. If you've got somebody that is making fun of your church or or tells you you read the Bible too much, or you're serving too much, that's really not a good relationship to have. What you need is someone who builds you up, not tears you down. You see, you're ready for marriage when you're not anxious for marriage and are willing to live as a single person. I've told the story before, it bears repetition here, how that when Marie and I met, well, I had prayed and I had asked the Lord, I had said, God, put me to sleep to my desires. And then... I was teaching a Bible study. I said, I just want to do your will. So I was teaching a Bible study. My brother invited a young woman named Marie, and that's how I met her. And a couple months later, that's how we began dating. And so I've mentioned that story many times in this church, how that I had said, put me to sleep to my desires. And then the Lord brought me Marie, even as he brought Eve to Adam. Well, my son Joseph has heard that since he was a little boy. And, and he walked up to me. Uh, one day, and he said, Dad, he goes, I want to ask you a question. He said, you know that story of how that you, you asked God to put you to sleep to your desires, and, and then you met Mom? I said, yeah. He said, I got to tell you something, Dad. He said, I prayed that prayer two weeks ago. I said, really? He said, I prayed that prayer two weeks ago. He said, I got a problem. I said, what's the problem? He says, I got interested in a young woman in the church. And I said, really? And what's the problem? He said, Dad, I feel like I'm, I'm lying to God. I, I told God, put me to sleep to my desire, and now there's this girl. I said, son, let me tell you something in that story I've never said. I said, I prayed that prayer, and within three weeks, I met your mom. I said, what do you think? I became a hermit, went off into a mountain, and stayed there for years? <laughs> that did not happen. I said, all God wants is your heart. 
There's no time limit on that. He said, really, Dad? I said, yeah. Now, this girl that he had this prayer for that he met is his wife, Karina. And it worked in his life that way, just like it did in mine. I said, God, I just want to serve you. And then God brought Karina to my Joseph the way God brought Marie to me. Don't compromise. Don't compromise. Don't be there saying, oh, I got to get married. I'm getting old. That's one fight nobody wins. Everybody grows old. It's better to grow old and walk with Jesus and not have a husband or a wife than to get married in an unwise fashion and to have the pain of an unequal or an unloving marriage. This woman was not willing to compromise. And so finally, and we'll close with verse 8, her beloved Solomon says this, If you do not know, O fairest among women, follow in the footsteps of the flock, and feed your little goats beside the shepherd's tent. Oh, that's clear. Thanks, Solomon. You're a beautiful woman. You're lovely. You're a prize. But if you want the answer, if you want my love, now notice, follow the footsteps of the flock. Feed your little goats. All you need to do is continue in the way that you're living. Retain your innocence. Retain your character. Do not move away from them. And the result, you will have the love of your life. Just keep moving in the direction you're going. And the Lord has a way of connecting the one into your path. And it's the right one at the right moment. We'll stop here. And we'll pick up next time at verse 9. Father, we ask that you would work within us, that we would not compromise our faith, and we would look for the things that are real. In the case of Solomon, the Shulamite saw him as a man who was very handsome, but he was also a man of great character, a godly man. And Father, that is what you would have for all of us to, in our relationships, to have a godly relationship. To have someone in our life who makes us better because they are in our life is our desire. So I ask that you would work that in all of us today. We husbands, and even these who are single men, may we be spiritual men and become spiritual leaders or be spiritual leaders in our homes. And our ladies, may they live as ladies, not compromising, but living with purity, retaining innocence, and looking for the proper things in a man. And Father, we ask that you would just work in us your will, and we would serve you with all of our hearts. Even as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed, perhaps there are some in this room who need prayer right now. I want to pray for you before we close. And if you need to get right with the Lord or you have a concern that you're lifting to him, would you lift your hand now? Let me pray for you right now. Father, you see these hands and you know what they all represent. You know that there are needs here on the spiritual level and sometimes on a very practical level and everything in between. I'm asking that you reach down. I'm asking that you touch these lives. And I'm asking, Lord, that you relieve them and that you minister to them. Lord, I ask that you would just work within us all, and may we just yield right now to you so that you might just work within us. We give you praise for this, and we receive from you now, Lord, and we thank you that you hear our voice. Bless you, Lord. Thank you. You can put your hands down. And Lord, would you keep moving amongst us to your glory? And we ask this now in Jesus' name. Amen. I pray the study was encouraging, and I want to thank you for your continued support and prayers and invite you to join us next Sunday night as we move into the next part of our study. As I mentioned earlier, if you would like to give your offering, you can do so online. If you're using a computer, click on the Give button in the upper right corner of your screen. If you're watching on your mobile device or iPad, click Give under the Menu button. If this is your first time giving digitally, Follow the instruction under four ways to give to process your gift. 
And finally, you can either mail your checks to 12205 North Pipeline Avenue, Chino, California, 91710, or if you're able, you can come to the sanctuary and use the kiosk we have in the foyer that are set up to process gifts. You can also place your gift in an envelope handed to one of the receptionists in the foyer. So thank you. God be with you. And we look forward to having you with us once again.